Christ the artist. It's not something you hear too often about Jesus being an artist. You hear about the Father being the creator, which of course he is. Let's go into this. This is from John 1. In the beginning was the Word, that being Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. This is Jesus. All things were made by him. So the Father is using the Word of God, Jesus, to create all things. So we need to remember that the Father is, of course, the creator, but, but so is Jesus, right? He's an artist. There's a question for you. What is art? What is art? So I came up with my own definition, which is something aesthetically pleasing created by a sentient being. But that's a really simple definition. Aesthetically pleasing. Okay, so it's something that's beautiful in some way. Okay, a sentient being. What's a sentient being? Well, it's any, any living creature that thinks and is conscious, right? So is an elephant a sentient being? Yes, it is. Because an elephant is most definitely a sentient being. It can think. In fact, they're pretty smart. And do elephants make art? Yes, of course they do. Of course. Elephants are great painters. It's something I, I just found out about. So they, they, they totally are. So that's, that's going to be the definition we're going to go off of. I think it's a fair definition. It's something aesthetically pleasing created by a sentient being. Okay, the, this is the artistic soul of Christ. Christ's artistic nature. He's the root of Jesse. He's the true vine. He's the source of what? Here's some things. Imagination, creativity, originality, purity of intention, individuality, and simultaneously unity. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Whew. That's a lot of stuff. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, this is from Ephesians. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Right here, Jesus. Wow. Great artist. All of you, you are pieces of art. Created in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father. So, I want to talk about this for a second. De Profundis. Does anybody know what this is besides Evan and Stuart? <laughs> Okay, okay. Who knows who this is, who this guy is? Very good, Oscar Wilde. Okay, Oscar Wilde, arguably the greatest author of his generation. He's a Victorian author, arguably the greatest artist of, of his whole generation, honestly. He was imprisoned in the, the late 1800s, and if you know anything about Oscar Wilde, he, he was this terrible sinner, according to the classical Christian definition. And he was a man who lived for the pleasures of the flesh and the pleasures of the table and, and so on and so forth. He goes to prison for two years and he has nothing to read but the Bible. And what happens is he has this incredible counter with Christ in prison. And his life is completely changed. And he, he writes about this encounter in a, in a letter that he wrote to somebody and the title of this letter is now known as De Profundis, which in Latin means from the depths. So I'm going to be referencing this letter tonight in a number of, a number of these points. So just wanted to prep you with that. Sonship, what is sonship? Well, part of sonship is the art of dying. It's kind of an interesting thing. <laughs> I think I, I remember in Braveheart, Braveheart, William Wallace, Mel Gibson says, uh, he says, he says to God, give me the strength to die well. <laughs> I always thought that was pretty intense, but now we're living it out every day. So <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I spit out the antidote. None of the pain is going to be dulled. We got We got to experience it. Okay, our Father is teaching us how to die to the world. This is from Matthew. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. 
For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know this. You know this, but this is new again tonight. This is new again tonight. This is from Galatians. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You know this, but this is new. It's brand new. Thank you, Lord. Count the cost. You're going to have to count the cost of this. This is, this is going to cost you a lot. Following Jesus is going to cost you a lot. Man, whew. Some of you younger sons maybe don't know that quite yet, but you will. It's going to be worth it. Don't worry. Don't worry. Praise the Lord. This is from Luke. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. That's pretty intense. But we know, thankfully, that this means you just got to have your priorities straight because he comes first and our walk with Christ comes first before anything else, and that's okay. Just, just be at rest in that. This is brand new. Thank you, Lord. So what are the, what's the age of the sons of God? What, how, how old are the sons of God? Eternal. Eternal. Oh, we know that one. <laughs> that's, come, that's to the back row. Come on. This is just a reminder. <laughs> you can have no rebuttals to that. None tonight. I will not, I will not hear any. Okay, so what's the difference in terms of our time in the world and life, and life experience? Because yes, okay, young sons, we do, we do have a different amount of time in the world. So you could be 100 years old and you could be 13 years old. There's no difference in terms of your true age, both eternal, but there is a difference in terms of your time in the world. And what's the difference? It's life experience, and that, that is a valuable thing. Okay, why? Because you're probably feeding on different spiritual sustenance if you're a 100-year-old believer and a 13-year-old believer. It's okay. It's normal. This is normal. So if you're young, I'm going to say younger than 13 because I think you're, you're starting to feed on solid food. But let's say you're 6, 7, 8 years old. You're still feeding on spiritual milk probably. It's okay. But when you're an adult son, you're feeding on solid spiritual food. Okay, when you're feeding on milk... the you're going to have a tendency to view Jesus from afar because you, you haven't really experienced him fully. You haven't, you haven't taken up your cross yet. At what age do you take up your cross? Well, each person's different, but probably not going to take up your cross with your first trial until you're at least a teenager. That would be my guess. Could be younger. Okay, a sentiment, this is from Oscar Wilde. A sentimentalist is, is simply one who desires to have the luxury of an emotion without paying for it. And I think all of us can probably remember the time in our Christian walks when this, this was true. We were sentimentalists in Christ, but we hadn't yet experienced the cross. And it's okay. It's spiritual milk. Feeding on spirit, spiritual food, solid food. It's conviction for God's kingdom and sympathy for others is learned through suffering and our death to the world on the cross. I'm going to read this again. Conviction for God's kingdom and sympathy for others is learned through suffering and our death to the world on the cross. This is the real truth. This is from Wilde again. Christ realized in the entire sphere of human relations that imaginative sympathy which in the sphere of art is the sole secret of creation. He understood the leprosy of the leper, the darkness of the blind, the fierce misery of those who live for pleasure, and the strange poverty of the rich. So what does this mean? It means that until you experience suffering, until you experience, experience the cross, you're not feeding on sp solid spiritual food. When you are, you begin to have imaginative sympathy, which is experiencing the leprosy of the leper, the darkness of the blind, the fierce misery of those who live for pleasure. So this is just a prep for the younger sons. I hope, if this doesn't make sense, it's okay. It's okay because just receive it. Just receive it by faith. <clears throat> I want to talk about Buddhism for a moment because it's a, it's a very fascinating religion you think about the art of dying, and you say, well, that sounds a lot like Buddhism, doesn't it? Sort of relinquishing all pleasures of the world. 
which is, which is what Buddhism is about, relinquishing all desires. And it's true, and there is a lot of wisdom in Buddhism, there is. There's a lot of truth in Buddhism, but I, I don't believe it's the truth because it's apart from Christ. Ultimately, if you're simply relinquishing the, the hold of the world, but you're not grabbing onto Jesus, as far as I can see, it's just you're opening yourself up to oblivion. It's nothing, nothingness. So it's, it doesn't really make sense. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have fulfillment. Although there are principles of wisdom in it. <clears throat> so sonship's also the, the art of living. It's not just death. We're here to live. This is eternal life. That's, are you ready for eternal life? It's, kind, it's time to stand up and fight. Thank you. Well, that's what I, I love that about Christ is that I, I want life. I don't want to just relinquish and you know, go th float off in the ether somewhere in the universe. That doesn't, that doesn't really interest me. I don't, I, I don't, know, I don't know about you guys. Um, I'm interested in eternal potential, eternal life with the father. So this is the father's lesson to the sons. We, gotta, we have to die to the world, but be alive in Christ. Amen. Amen. This is from John Chapter 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Here are some rules for living. This is from John 17. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's eternal life. Wow. This is from Matthew. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Some great rules for living here. Colossians. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Wow. One body, peace in our hearts, be thankful. These are some great rules for living. Also from Romans. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present in your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Some excellent rules for living. <clears throat> Here's some more. Th this is something that Wilde said. Jesus said that people should not be too serious over material common interests, that to be unpractical was a great thing, that one should not bother too much over affairs. Man, that's a hard one to do. One should not bother too much over affairs. This is from Luke. This is Jesus saying that. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Tonight, this is new for you. you, you I, just cast any anxieties aside. This is new for you. I'm going to read this again. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing of that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Let's be at peace tonight. We cannot, <laughs> we can change nothing by being anxious. Now, this is a lesson we, we might have to learn hundreds and hundreds of times, but let's learn it tonight. This is a new, new word. This is a living word. This is the, an interesting thing that Jesus does too. He makes children the new archetype for godly character. What does that mean? Somebody back there in that back row, tell me what the archetype of godly character is. <laughs> All right, girls, we've got to study the dictionary a little bit more. <laughs> All right, this is from Wilde. He says, uh, Jesus held children up as examples to their elders which I myself has, have always thought the chief use of children, if what is perfect should have a use. Amen. Your examples to us, kids, too. I saw that eye rolling back there. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. This is, for Matthew, this is for Matthew 18. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, one thing I can really say about Celebration City, I, I, I love the body of Christ. 
I'm in support of all churches, right? But one thing about this particular building and this particular local body is that we kind of act like kids in the best of ways. I mean, we're, we're, we're growing mature, but we're all, we also have the freedom of kids. If you come in here, it's fun. We're having fun. We're at peace. We're just, we're just having a good time with the Lord. I mean, that, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's the art of living. That is the art of living. We are the children, actually, that are the examples to the rest of the body of Christ. Amen. It's not just you in the back row there. It's me. Okay? <laughs> okay. Art without sin. Wow. There's a concept right there. I, I was having a conversation a number of years ago with one of my then friends who, who was an artist. Then, for, yeah, then friends. <laughs> you have to die to a lot of things. <laughs> and uh, look at this. This is kind of a cool painting, though, isn't it, by the way? This is, I, li I like the fruits. This is the tree of, of knowledge, probably. Anyway, they, they do look very succulent. So she, she was an artist, and I, she understood that I was a believer, and I think I was probably discussing this in some detail. <clears throat> and she said, I don't think how, there would be no good art if Eve hadn't tasted of the forbidden fruit. There would be no good art if there were no sin and depravity and suffering in the world. Think about that for a second. <laughs> okay, but you, honestly, I think in, in the moment, my, my carnal mind said, man, she's got a really good point. Hmm, that's interesting, because most of the great art you see seems to come out of suffering or sadness or frustration or something. That's most of the art that we see in the world. But then I came to the realization that we have no idea all of the, what the Father intended for us in the Garden of Eden. Something for you to think about. Adam and Eve, they lived in communion with the animals. There was no dying. There was, there was no... I mean, you're hanging out with lions and tigers and cheetahs and playing around with them. <laughs> That's just a glimpse of what the Garden of Eden was like. So... We cannot say that there would be no great art without sin. That is, that is blindness right there. Escape artistry. You are an escape artist. So am I. Praise the Lord. Here, this is from Romans. For, the, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Wow. And that's something that you do realize going along. It, I remember as a kid reading the Bible and it said, uh, sin is death. Sin is death. I'm thinking about myself, no, wait, sin isn't death. Sin is kind of fun. And then I came to the realization that no, no sin, is, sin is totally death. <laughs> so, so, some, some way along. Back row, you need to hear that. Okay, no more talking back there. Unless it's discussing these slides in detail. This is some carnal logic for you. This is from Oscar. Thank you, Oscar. The fatal errors of life are not due to man's being unreasonable. An unreasonable moment may be one's finest moment. They are due to man's being logical. So the fatal errors of life are due to man's being logical. And what he's talking about, he's talking about the carnal logic. Whoa, that is deep. Wow, that's a kick in the gut. <laughs> so in terms of escaping the carnal mind, what, what, it, what was escaping the carnal mind for the Pharisees? Well, I can tell you it was laws, rules, regulation, Edumacation. That's what, that's what escaping the carnal mind was. <laughs> Education, I was joking. Uh, escape, escape. <laughs> that's what escaping the carnal mind was for the Pharisees, all right? What, what is escaping the carnal mind for the sons? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. 
That's, what's, that's what separates us from the carnal mind, is the blood of Jesus Christ. You're praying for the mind of Christ to receive that mind of Christ. Hallelujah. And you're just getting washed in the blood of Christ. That's getting away from the carnal mind. So remember that. It's not rules. It's not regulations. This is not how much scripture you memorize. This is not edumacation. This is the blood of Christ. That is, your, that is the, the key to your escape artistry. The imagination of Christ. Okay, this is, this is from Mark 9. Jesus is saying this, all things are possible for one who believes. Whoa. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Imagination. This is, this is Oscar. Imagination is the basis of all spiritual and material life. To Christ, imagination was simply a form of love. And that to him, love was Lord in the fullest meaning of the phrase. Hmm. Wow. The lack of imagination is indeed a fatal defect. As you go on in life, you realize that if you don't have an imagination, it, it will cause your death in so many ways. Not on the cross, but just death. This is, this is Oscar. An unimaginative nature, if something be not done to rouse it, will become petrified into absolute insensibility. So that while the body may eat and drink and have its pleasures, the soul, whose house it is, may be dead absolutely. If you don't have an, an imagination from the Lord, the soul is probably dead. Do you have a problem? Or do Babylon simply tell you you have a problem? I'm going I'm to say this again for the, for, the, the for the sons that are the same exact age as everybody else in the back row. Do you have, do you have a problem? Or did Babylon simply tell you you have a problem? Just keep that in mind. I'm, this doesn't have to relate to today, but I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. Babylon's going to try to tell you you have a problem. You don't have a problem. Yeah, exactly. I, I remember Michael saying, I think just a few weeks ago, he said he's never been lonely. And I thought that that was just, I mean, that was pretty mind-boggling to me. But then, of course, he has the imagination of Christ. You don't have to be lonely. That's just Babylon telling you you have a problem. Christ's imagination is beyond time and space. And we keep talking about that, the time capsule. It's beyond time and space. Christ's imagination, beyond time and space. Here's something for you from Oscar Wilde. Repentance is the means by which one alters one's past. The Greeks thought that impossible. They often say in their gnomic aphorisms, even the gods cannot alter the past. Christ showed that the commonest sinner could do it. <laughs> this is time travel in, in a moment from the commonest sinner. You already altered your past by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the imagination of Christ. It's beyond time and space. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. The nature and character of Babylon, well, we know this pretty well at this point, Philistinism. Now, in the Bible, Philistine, well, the tradition, I'm going to say the Victorian definition of Philistinism is essentially lust, excessive lust, going after the pleasures of the flesh, the pleasures of the world. That's the, that's the historical definition of Philistinism. But the definition that, that Oscar Wilde uses, I think, is... is more powerful and more interesting. Let's look what that is. It's, he, he basically uses the term Philistinism to refer to normalcy, to keeping up appearances, to doing what is expected by society, keeping the status quo. And I'm going to say it's also Pharisaism because they, they really go hand in hand. Why is Philistinism bad for art? It's an interesting question. Interesting question. Why is Philistinism bad for art? <clears throat> Philistinism, normalcy. It's a lack of imagination. That's what it is. When you're keeping the status quo, you, you're not having the mind and the imagination of Christ. So God meant for the Israelites and the sons to be apart from Babylon. This is from 1 Peter. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. 
the character of the Jews of Jesus' day. Okay, so in Jesus' day, the Romans had control over Judea. And where were the, where were the Jews seeking protection? Was it from God? No. No, it was, it was from traditions, rituals, education, the law. Maybe some really strong Jewish guy would be born and conquer all of the, the Romans with some army of zealots. Who knows? That's, this is the stuff that they were, they were placing their hope in. It wasn't in the Lord. They couldn't even see Jesus because they were, they were just hoping in something carnal. That's what they were placing all their trust in. All the good intentions of the Pharisees with the laws and the regulations, and the this, and the that, and the keeping the status quo, all this Philistinism of the Pharisees, this is what Oscar Wilde has to say about it. All bad art is the result of good intentions. Think about that. All bad art is the result of good intentions. So Philistinism and Pharisaism, they, they go hand in hand. The status quo, keeping of the traditions, doing what's expected, carnal mind, focusing on the carnal mind. Would Jesus have gone to seminary? I, you know, I know that I've talked about this before, and I, I, I understand. If you're going to, to seminary to, to translate Bibles into new languages, or you're going there to learn Greek or Hebrew, Lord bless you, that's great, that's fantastic. But would Jesus have gone to seminary? No. Jesus would absolutely have not gone to seminary. And the proof is that he didn't become a Pharisee. He, he, he would have gone to Sunday school, though. <laughs> and he did. And he did. He was definitely, he was definitely in the synagogue learning, learning the scriptures, all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Pharisees and, and, and what I call obvious artists, what do they have in common? Well, What's an obvious artist? An, an obvious artist is somebody who looks like an artist, who dresses like an artist, who talks like an artist, who has the opinions of an artist. That's exactly what a Pharisee is. They play the part. And you probably know some believers, Lord bless them, who are playing the part. They are the obvious artists in, in God's kingdom. But that's not us. This is from Oscar. The Philistine element in life is not the failure to understand art. Charming people such as fishermen, shepherds, plowboys, peasants, and the like know nothing about art and are the very salt of the earth. He is the Philistine who upholds and aids the heavy, cumbrous, blind, mechanical forces of society and who does not recognize the dynamic force when he meets it either in a man or a movement. Who's the dynamic force? Jesus. What's the movement? The sons of God. Praise the Lord. Recognize the dynamic force. Do not be a Philistine. This is the nature and character of Christ. We have the artistic nature of Christ. We are made in his image, right? by him and through him. Everything must, co this is from Oscar, everything must come to one out of one's own nature. There is no use in telling a person a thing they don't feel and can't understand. How does this relate to us? Because of this. Jesus, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. See, we are of his own nature and we can understand. Thank you, Lord. So, <clears throat> right now we're sculpting Christ-like character, right? That's the art that's going on. The deepest form of art is not paintings or music or physical sculptures or even great architecture, okay? The deepest form of art is what is being fashioned in our souls. So when we, 
eschew Philistinism, cast it out, cast it away. We expect the unexpected because we are not keeping up the status quo. We are loving our enemies. We are turning the other cheek. We are not, not engaging in lustful thoughts which are equal to adultery. Wow, that's an interesting thing. When Jesus says even a thought is equal to, equal to adultery. So this is from Oscar again. Every little action of the common day makes or unmakes character. And that therefore what one has done in the secret chamber, one has someday to cry aloud on the housetops. I'm going to read this again because this, this is going to punch you in the gut in, in the best of ways. There is, no, there is no small secret sin, right? Every little action of the commonest day makes or unmakes character. And that therefore one, what one has done in the secret chamber, one has someday to cry aloud on the housetops. This is Oscar Wilde on humility. One cannot give it away, and another may not give it to one. One cannot acquire it except by surrendering everything that one has. It is only when one has lost all things that one knows that one possesses it. Thank you, Lord. From Philippians. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even on a cross. He lost all things. He surrendered everything. That's the nature and the character of Christ. You know, one thing I think about is um, <clears throat> the uniqueness of Christ. And there have been points when I have been meditating or, or just thinking about the Lord when... <laughs> Sort of the significance of, of the fact that he was unique, meaning completely different from anything anyone else, is hit me so hard. And maybe you felt that too. This is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Nothing is more rare in any man than an act of his own. So when Jesus came to the world, every act was of his own. He was doing the will of the Father, but every act was of his own, and it was unique. I can't say very unique or totally unique because those, that's redundant. It's unique. This is what Oscar Wilde has to say about it. Most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions. Their life is a mimicry. Their passion's a quotation. Christ was not merely the supreme individualist, but he was the first in history. Now, you might be thinking, hey, Tyler, but you're quoting Oscar Wilde right now. These are, this, these are his thoughts. Ah, I'm one with Oscar Wilde in Christ. Thank you very much. These are my thoughts. These are my thoughts. What are you talking about? Come on now. Give me some credit. Give yourself some credit. Let's go. The path of the individual. This is from Matthew. Jesus is talking, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Do acts of your own. Do the acts of Christ. Very good. Thank you, thank you. So Christ is the supreme individual, and we are members of his body. Wow. Praise the Lord. So if you have read Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, almost 700 years before Christ was born, refers to Jesus as a man of sorrows. Now, I know we have the joy of the Lord, which is absolutely true, but Isaiah does refer to Jesus as a man of sorrows because it was in reference to what was going to have to transpire in his carnal existence. This is from Hebrews for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Suffering and sorrow. These are important things. They teach us character. They teach us how to be like Christ. Because 
we are, when we go through sufferings and sorrows, we are experiencing just a little portion of what he went through. And we are better able to relate to Jesus when we go through sufferings and trials. These are very important things. And sometimes you have to do these things until there are no more tears left to cry. That was an inside joke. That was an inside joke. All right. Back row, I'm trying to keep you listening. All right. <laughs> All right, you got it. <laughs> okay. This is, this is from Guta. Who never ate his bread in sorrow, who never spent the midnight hours weeping and waiting for the morrow, he knows ye not ye heavenly powers. If, you're, if you've never eaten your bread in sorrow, if, you, if you've never spent the midnight hours weeping and waiting for the morrow, you don't know the heavenly powers because that's what Jesus had to experience. <clears throat> this is Oscar. What one had felt dimly through instinct about art is intellectually and emotionally realized with perfect clearness of vision and absolute intensity of apprehension. I now see that sorrow, being the supreme emotion of which man is capable, is at once the type and test of all great art. It is very important that we understand sorrow and that we can appreciate it to better align ourselves with the walk of Christ. Ultimately, we have the joy of the Lord, but we do have to recognize this when it, when it transpires. <clears throat> this is, man, whew. This is Oscar again. Read this with me. The, for the secret to life is suffering. It is what is hidden behind everything. When we begin to live, what is sweet, and, and back row, I really want you to pay attention. This is really, really, really important. When we begin to live, okay, what is sweet is so sweet to us, and what is bitter, so bitter, that we inevitably direct all our desires towards pleasure. And seek not merely for a month or twain to feed on honeycomb, which means just to live for pleasure, right? But for all our years to taste no other food, ignorant the while that while, ignorant the while that we may be really starving the soul. So if you only want to taste pleasure, you're starving the soul. Out of sorrow have worlds been built, and at the birth of a child or a star, there is pain. This is another quote from him. Now it seems to me that love of some kind is the only possible explanation of the extraordinary amount of suffering that there is in the world. I cannot conceive of any other explanation. I am convinced that there is no other, and that if the worlds have indeed, as I have said, been built out of sorrow, it has been by the hands of love, because in no other way could the soul of man, for whom the worlds are made, reach the full stature of its perfection. Pleasure for the beautiful body, but pain for the beautiful soul. We can't starve our souls by trying to distract from trials with drugs and worldly carnal pleasures because then we're starving the soul. This is a very interesting quote. Every single work of art is the fulfillment of a prophecy. For every work of art is the conversion of an idea into an image. Every single human being should be the fulfillment of a prophecy. So if that's true, then what prophecy are you fulfilling? What, what prophecy? What prophecy? Here's one for you from Hosea. Out of Egypt I called my son. There's a prophecy that you're fulfilling right now. He's calling us out of the world. His sons. And that's a beautiful moment when you come to the realization of that. You're the fulfillment of so many prophecies, and so am I. Thank you, Lord. This is from Oscar again. Christ was the denial as well as the affirmation of prophecy. For every expectation that he fulfilled, there was another that he destroyed. 
I, I wrote this, so. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Those whom he saved from their sins are saved simply for beautiful moments in their lives. Whoa. That is, I, I've never thought about that. Well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> See, she got the joke. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, the woman at Bethany breaks a jar of nard and anoints Jesus' feet with her hair after she's forgiven, or around when she's forgiven, right? That's, she's saved for a beautiful moment in her life. As he writes in the dirt, a woman caught in adultery is poetically vindicated by Jesus amidst a mob of seething hypocrites. Wow. What a beautiful moment that is. He heals a ruined man possessed by literally a legion of demons. That's a beautiful moment. Think about the art, all the art that he was manifesting. Wow, every moment, beautiful. And every moment of our lives should be beautiful. What, what, what does that mean? I mean, every moment beautiful? I mean, I, when I'm cleaning the kitchen? When you're cleaning the kitchen, you're singing a song to the Lord. You're, you're thinking about how, gr what's that? And that too, you're, you're, preparing, you're preparing for your family. You're, you're being grateful for the family that you're preparing for. When, <clears throat> when you're handed a parking ticket violation, you, you praise the Lord that you have a car. That's a beautiful moment. Basically, you know what? Every moment of your life should be beautiful. That's the imagination of Christ. That's like what Michael was saying, never been lonely, because that's the attitude, that's the imagination of Christ. That is art. That is art in your soul being sculpted and manifested. That's, that's what we're doing. We're making the choice that every moment of our life is gonna be beautiful. Even what the carnal, the carnal world's gonna say, every moment of your life is not beautiful, it's not glamorous, it's not as fun as it should be. That's just, that's, that's, that's a carnal opinion. That's, that's not, that's not lasting any more than a few more years, okay? The open heart of the humble ignoramus. I'm, there are a lot of quotes today, but I, I just think these are deeply impactful, and I spent a lot of time writing them, so. Uh, <laughs> like all, this, is, this is from Oscar. Like all poetical natures, Christ loved ignorant people. He knew that in the soul of one who is ignorant, there is always room for a great idea. But he could not stand stupid people, especially those who are made stupid by education. People who are full of opinions, not one of which they can understand, a, a peculiarly modern type, and one summed up by Christ when he describes it as the type who has the key to knowledge, can't use it himself, and won't allow other people to use it, though it may be to open the gate of God's kingdom. This is, this is what the Pharisees were doing, okay? In their heavy inaccessibility to idea, their dull respectability, their tedious orthodoxy, their worship of vulgar success, their entire preoccupation with the gross materialistic side of life, and their ridiculous estimate of themselves and their importance, the Jews of Jerusalem in Christ's day were the exact counterpart of the British, American, Philistines of our own. These are the things that we are eschewing. <laughs> no, 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 no. We have the joy of the Lord. We're not into this tedious orthodoxy, this worship of vulgar success and a preoccupation with the gross materialistic side of life. No, no, no. Okay, the secret of Christ. So we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We have the body of Christ. We know that we're seated at the right hand of the Father. We know that we're the bride of Christ. What, what, is, what does all this say right here? That's oneness. That's unity. All of this is representing oneness and unity. I remember Michael said, Father, why has life at times been so hard? Does anybody remember what 
what he said, what God's response was, <laughs> besides Michael. <laughs> yes, thank you. Exactly, because you forgot you were one with me. She was. I knew that. <laughs> okay. Wilde describes the secret, this secret of Christ, this very secret that we're going to talk about as Lord Christ's heart and Shakespeare's brain. Whatever happens to another happens to oneself. And this is exactly what we've been talking about tonight. <laughs> I'm going to say this again. Whatever happens to another happens to oneself. And the world will try to tell you that's not true, but when we're standing up, somebody's standing up, any one of us is standing up and rebuking sickness, we're all doing that. When one of us has a success, we all have success. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Praise you. So true. What, what exactly is the carnal culmination of this? Okay. The cross. Because what happened on the cross, Jesus took all of our sin. It happened to him. It happened to him. So our sin happened to him. And what's, what, what is the eternal culmination of this? We're raised up and seated with him. His glory happened to us. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> now, the secret of Christ, part two. This is interesting. So to live for others, other people, according to the classic Christian altruistic sense, was not the basis of Jesus' creed. So to live for other people, that, that really wasn't the point of why Jesus came. That's not the point of why he came. Okay? Forgive your enemies. Why did he say forgive your enemies? Beat cold on the head? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So he said, forgive your enemies so that the one who needed to forgive could be saved. It's not for the sake of the enemies, but for you who needs to forgive. Wow. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. Why did he say that? Is it because the poor needed the money? Well, yeah, but is that really the point? No, it's not for the poor, but for the, those whose souls are marred by wealth. Wow. This is from Oscar. But while Christ did not say to men, live for others, he pointed out that there was no difference at all between the lives of others and one's own life. Wow. <laughs> There is no difference at all between the lives of others and one's own life. Since his coming, the history of each separate individual is or can be made the history of the world. There's a common element to carnal existence which everybody who comes to adulthood experiences. What is it? Well, it's a fall from grace and redemption. Should you choose the redemption? Mm 